I think nowadays, uh, with what's happening in the world, we are not filling vessels any longer. We are definitely gardeners planting seeds and trying to plant the correct seeds in the correct soil, which is quite difficult and therefore differentiation is, is key. As voices do professor. As voices do professor. Teachers' voices. Welcome to a special episode of Teachers' Voices, a podcast made from the stories of teachers from around the world, talking in their own words. I'm your host, Nina Alonso, and today, in celebration of World Teachers' Day, I'm bringing you a bonus episode to provide short inspirational stories, together with quick practical ideas and sources that my guests have shared with me. The links to the tips and resources shared here can be found in the show notes and on bold.expert. In the latest episode of Teacher's Voices, we have listened to researchers and educators around the world working with the International Baccalaureate Organization in looking for ways to create learning environments that support curiosity and creativity. We are in an unprecedented moment in time in which the international community at global and local levels is trying to gather all possible efforts to fight a tremendous global learning crisis, which means that around 70% of children in low- and middle-income countries cannot read and understand a simple text by age 10. So today, to mark World Teachers' Day, I would like to celebrate the inspiring and motivational perspectives of some education researchers and teachers I have recently been speaking with. Thank you to Sladana and Sarah from the Australian Council for Educational Research who have been conducting research in collaboration with International Baccalaureate. Thanks to Ingrid, Asmin, Monica, Marie and Kylie, teachers who took part in this project for their insights. Be sure to listen to episode 6 to hear about their experiences exploring the role of curiosity and creativity in the classroom. Many educators tell me that important moments in their lives shaped who they are and how they approach their education commitment. Listen now to the turning points that made them the engaged and motivated teachers and researchers they are today. Let's first hear about Sarah and Sladana's experiences as students. I think from very early age I wanted to work in education and it's probably due to the importance we placed where I come from. So I come from Yugoslavia. I grew up there before uh, Yugoslavia fell apart. And there was a lot of focus on education as something that can make you feel different from others. Something you, it, it felt like a way to contribute to the society. So the if you take learning seriously and if you continue with your education, then you can contribute to the society in the best possible way. So I, I think I knew from very early on that that's one area that I really want to work on. And then it was obviously making a choice whether I want to be a teacher, whether I want to work on the research side or on the policy side. And I've done a combination of the things. So I've done, worked on the policy for civil service and I've done a little bit of teaching at university when I was studying. But I think it's the research that excites me the most. And what I find so incredible about research is that no two projects are the same. Each project you work with brings with it, with it, you know, within its its own challenges, its own new learning ways of working, and you feel in small way you are contributing to the future of education and how that's going to translate into the practice down to the classroom in terms of how teaching is done and how learning happens. Look, I grew up in in the UK, and I I had this absolutely fantastic teacher at school, Miss Wickenden. And she was the geography teacher. And I'd always had a, a natural sort of curiosity in the world around me. But what was fantastic about Miss Wickenden was that she didn't just teach geography. She'd been to all of the places. So, you know, when she taught us about glaciers, she had photos of glaciers that she'd visited. She talked about what it was like to walk on a glacier. She really brought it alive. And so that not only inspired in me that the desire to really travel and work around the world, but also to find out more about those international dimensions. So I started out my career as a teacher. I was a teacher for 12 years, and I became particularly interested in what happens when 
um, students are exposed to, to international influences, how that, that can help change them and and um, particularly the notion of global citizenship. So I ended up doing a PhD in that area. And I'm, I'm really lucky I get to work on lots of different projects. But for me, that the really exciting ones are those with the international dimension. And in this project, when we were looking at creativity and curiosity, one of the key parameters was to consider different cultures, different countries. Also, as a university student, Ingrid, who now teaches in China, experienced a personal challenge that made her want to become an educator. For me, it was uh, when I was, uh, I was first year at university, I got a tumor and I thought that I would die. And I thought I was a good student just following what my parents said. So I was supposed to become an engineer because an engineer is a safe job and you get a lot of money, you buy a big house, a big car. And then I got this tumor and I thought, oh my gosh, what is life? And I thought that I wanted to actually become an educator because I wanted to learn all the time. I felt that when you have another job, you learn less than when you are an educator. And I really wanted to make students actually reflect on their life and not just follow. And the same way as, as a good student, I, I, I was just following what people were asking me to do. And uh, I was trying to do it my best, but I, there was no, no real input from me. I was just a good servant of education. And, uh, and that's why I thought, okay, I'm going to be, become a teacher. I'm going to see the world because uh, we never know if tomorrow is going to happen. So I want to see the beauty of the world and I want to spread this beauty. And I want to show the, the, the young generation that actually it's important to know, but there's more to it. As a university lecturer myself, whose students are future educators, I found heartwarming the stories of Australian teachers, Maury and Kylie, whose first experiences as trainee teachers left an important imprint on how they wanted to approach the teaching profession. I started out my early career uh, in a rural school, in a public school, and it had composite classrooms. So I was teaching from kindergarten, year one, year two, and year three, all in the one classroom. And I think it was at that point in time that I really valued differentiation and the importance of Um, collaboration, but differentiation, not necessarily according to what year level the students were at, but according to their developmental levels. Mm -hmm. So that was probably the most significant life-changing event for me. I would have said um, my, in university, my second practicum where I was out in a school And I was there for four weeks and I just developed such a beautiful rapport with the students in my care. And whilst I always thought that I'd want to be a teacher, it was that practicum that made me realise that it was a passion for me and it was definitely the area I wanted to pursue. I felt quite emotional leaving, leaving the class after four weeks, but that's when I knew that I could make a difference to students' lives and I just loved seeing their little minds grow and the impact that me and my lessons could have on them. Creating the best possible conditions for learning naturally focuses on the school environment, but a supportive learning community extends far beyond the classroom. Here is Asbin, a teacher in Mumbai in India. And I think this one life-changing experience was when in my second year after joining school, there was this huge 50-year celebration and I saw the entire community come together and these were parents, former parents, former teachers, alum, even the chefs, the cooks, everyone come together and create this video. And the mantra of that video was, no one is ever ex uh, or an alum of this school. And the whole focus, you know, I come from a very competitive school background. I did my state board schooling. And as a teacher, to completely break that and uh, adopt uh, a new culture, which is so forward thinking, uh, nurturing, Uh, I think that's that was the turning point in my life. You know, I actually saw how the school broke barriers between teachers and students and parents because, you know, you had the parents come to cook, you had the parents come to read stories, and it was such a warm relationship between the community. 
that completely transformed the way I, I thought. Let's hear now about some interesting resources and tips to foster students' curiosity and creativity shared by our teachers. We will begin by listening to Ingrid. I think in terms of book, I really like Ken Robinson, Out of Your Mind. I think it's a, it's a great analysis of education and he definitely makes you think. The tips is that to just look at how the students are developing but not just in the short term. For teachers working with primary school children, Maureen and Kylie from Australia recommended this. Another good book, Nina, is The Day the Crayons Quit, which is a really quite interesting text. It's about creativity and difference in diversity and that's um, intercultural understandings as well. I know there's Knowledge Works is um, forecasting the future of education because we really need to be on the front foot of education today. And to do that is quite challenging. But as a global school, we do, we do tap into Knowledge Works and um, they have a, a blog and resources and um, professional learning opportunities there. So that's a great one. Kath Murdoch is an Australian teacher, very well known within Australia for her work in inquiry models. And we have been lucky enough to have Kath come and present to our school a couple of years back now, but she regularly produces a newsletter that pops into my email address, which I thoroughly enjoy. And But yes, her blogs and her monthly emails I find to be an excellent source of generating curiosity in my students. And here are Asmin's recommendations. And another book that I really liked was um, a Flyaway Boy, which I read recently. It's by Jane D'Souza. Oh, it's amazing. It talks about how, you know, how we kind of box everyone and we label everyone. And it actually is in sync with the creativity framework. But you should read that book. It's fantastic. And so still the focus lies heavily on writing. And while that might be important in the classrooms, I think one practical tip is to not forget that the learner needs to be excited about learning and bringing in new creative experiences into the classroom. Like I personally use a lot of drama tools, like I mentioned, and uh, I, David Farmer is a fantastic resource, you know, the inspiring drama teacher. And uh, I've learned a lot from him. And if you enroll for that program, then you every uh, two, three weeks, we kind of have Zoom meetings uh, where we share pedagogic practices, where he tells us about new drama, things that he's tried in his classroom. We share what we have. Asmin and I also talked about Jidu Krishnamurti's lectures. As a source of inspiration, we both recommend. I would also recommend a short blog post in the conversation called Five questions answered about how to keep your kids curious. Let's conclude this bonus episode with some of the best advice our teachers wanted to share. For me, the, con the conscious decision has always been to keep varying strategies such that, you know, my, my learners who are differently abled are as excited about coming to class, trying to learn as the average class. And... So personally, for me, the one thing that I do is I do extensive research on pedagogic tools, something which can then uh, make the learning more transferable for that child. And I think that's the real assessment. That's what we actually believe, that if you're able to transfer your learning, if you're able to apply your learning, if you're able to do something which is from self to beyond, maybe something like a social entrepreneurship, something that we want to bring in into our school in a big manner, So these are real outcomes of learning. And this is what, as teachers, we always endeavor to move towards that uh, person inquiries. That's such a, a beautiful way to show what you're learning in school. And I think that's the real assessment. Being able to engage with students on a personal level according to where they're at is where most students will, will flourish in their own domain. 
From my perspective, I think building time into your week or your fortnight or your month in the classroom for students to have time to follow an interest, develop um, develop their knowledge of something that they're interested in or something that they they want to learn more about. There's no pressure on them to perform. There's no pressure on them to have an end result. It can be an ongoing process. It can be unfinished, but it just gives them time to experience either a curiosity or their own creativity. I hope you find the stories, tips and resources shared here useful. Thank you for listening to this special episode of Teachers' Voices. You can find the links of the resources on bolt.expert and in the show notes. Learn more about our guests and find links to the report of the Acer Research done about curiosity and creativity on behalf of the International Baccalaureate Organization, the IBO, and on the IBO website or visit bold.expert. Don't forget to subscribe and write a review if you have enjoyed this podcast. Stay tuned for the following episode where you will hear about how educators can help kids with attention difficulties thrive in the classroom and beyond.